This is lecture three, rational expectations and policy neutrality. The subject of policy effectiveness is focal in the ongoing debate between the classical school and Keynesian school of economics. The classical school believing that policy is ineffective so that changes in aggregate demand have no real effects and the Keynesian school believing that there is a place for policy and that we are able to manage the economy or to stabilise the volatility in real activity. Remember that the idea of intervening in the economy is to smooth the business cycle, to reduce the volatility in growth and try to avoid deep recessions. So now we go back to lecture two and we revisit the rational expectations model with a policy focus. We look at monetary policy in respect of the rational expectations model. In the context of rational expectations, we have some definitions. What is policy neutrality? This is the inability of changes in government expenditure or taxation or the money supply to have any real effect on the economy. And by real effect, we mean changes the ability to change output Y and employment L, the real variables. Money neutrality is more specific in it's the inability of monetary policy to have real effects. So that our equilibrium level of income is independent of the money stock and that's a variable we call M bar. You will see going forward. What is money super neutrality? Well, it's the inability of policy to affect real variables, but even when there is a change in the rate of growth of the money stock, so it's super neutrality. So even fast changes in the money supply have no real effect. Now, under adaptive expectations, exogenous or stabilisation monetary policy are effective, so that fits in with the Keynesian school, but under rational expectations, exogenous or stabilisation policy are policy neutral. So there is, they're ineffective, there is no effect. Here we have an example of an economy that's represented by three equations, one, two, and three. Here we have the aggregate demand equation, the aggregate supply equation, and another equation that explains the path of the money supply. So we can think of this equation as representing the policy maker. We have the demand side, the supply side, and the policy maker. So there are now three agents in our model. And to solve this model, which is a simple model, we can simply take equation three, which is that MT is driven by M bar plus the aggregate demand or monetary shock and substitute three into equation one. So we replace mt in equation one with m bar plus mu t. We then have two equations in y, and we can find the reduced form by equating the two right-hand sides. In other words, we can combine all three equations so that we have the right-hand side of the aggregate supply relation equal to the right-hand side of the aggregate demand equation with the which incorporates equation three. So much the same as in the previous week, or the same reduced form in the previous week, now we have the problem that there is an expected variable in the reduced form, so we take expectations. 
we take expectations of equation 4 and we have that gamma EPT, the expectation of PT is EPT, minus EPT, the expectation of EPT is just itself, equal to expectation of M bar, which is the expectation of this variable, minus the expectation of PT from here, and the expectation of mu t from here. Now the left hand side of this reduced form that we have taken expectations upon is equal to zero. EPT minus EPT is equal to zero. We know that the expectation of M bar is just M bar because it's a constant. The expectation of PT we can leave alone, but the expectation of mu t, the expectation of the shock it's just zero because we specify it that way. This simplifies to a solution for the expected price. That EPT is equal to M bar. If we substitute our solution for the expected price, EPT equal to M bar, into our reduced form, which is equation 4, we have that gamma PT minus M bar, now this was expected PT in the reduced form, but it's been replaced by the solution M bar, is equal to the right hand side of the reduced form, M bar minus PT plus mu T. Now if we bring the P's onto the left hand side, and the M's onto the right hand side, we can solve for P. Our solution for the price is PT equal to M bar plus 1 over 1 plus gamma times mu T. So let's discuss that solution, equation 6, in a bit more detail. The equilibrium price is driven by the exogenous money supply plus some proportion of the monetary shock, mu T. The strength of the effect of the shock on the price level is governed by the parameter gamma. Now we can take the solution for price and we can substitute it into the aggregate supply relation to get the solution for output. Remember that the aggregate supply relation was yt is equal to gamma times pt minus ept. Aggregate output supplied is equal to some proportion of the difference between the price level and the expected price. So let's substitute our solution for PT and our solution for EPT into the aggregate supply equation. Now we have that YT is equal to gamma times PT, which is now replaced by the solution given the equation 6, so this is here, now replaces PT in our solution. And our solution for EPT, which was M bar, is now replaced, we use that to replace EPT with M bar. So PT is replaced by its solution, which is here and EPT is replaced by its solution, which is here, which is M bar, which is equation 5. M bar minus M bar just gives us this term in the middle. M bar clears to zero. So we have the equilibrium output as Yt equal to gamma over 1 plus gamma times the monetary shock. Now let's just read into that solution for output. Output is driven by the monetary shock only. And notice the absence of M bar in the solution for output. This tells us that changes in the money supply will have no effect on equilibrium output. So we have policy neutrality. Here we have a graphical representation of the economy. Shows us our model and how our model reacts to a monetary shock mu t. We start in long run equilibrium at 
Y star, which is shown here by the long run aggregate supply curve, and our initial short run position, AD star and AS, where the AD star and AS curve intersect at point one. Now, after a positive demand shock, we see the aggregate demand function y equal to m bar minus pt becomes y equal to m bar plus mu t minus pt. This has given us a right shift in the AD curve, and the economy moves to point two along the aggregate supply curve. We have our e new equilibrium, level of output equal to gamma over 1 plus gamma mu t, and our new equilibrium price level, Pt, equal to m bar plus 1 over 1 plus gamma mu t. So prices have risen, risen, and over time, costs rise for firms, and the firms will reduce supply. So the aggregate supply curve shifts left, and the economy moves to point 3, where the money supply has filtered through to prices, so we are at a higher price level, but we are still at Y star in the long run uh, level of output. So here we have had some monetary shock. The economy has been shocked away from its short run equilibrium to a new level of output and prices, but higher prices have meant that the economy returns back to Y star. So we have seen mathematically and diagrammatically that given price flexibility and the rational expectations hypothesis, monetary policy leads to no real effects. There is money neutrality. If we increase the money supply, all we have is higher prices. This leads to higher inflation. So we have a nominal effect, but no real effects. We want to shock the economy we can do for a very short period we can have some short movement in output but this is one period only uh, and lives only so long as the shock lives to sum up then we see that the rational expectations model a micro founded has the demand and supply side can even incorporate a policy maker. However, the prediction, the RE prediction, is that any effect has to be very short lived. Output will always be at its long run rate, and monetary policy has no effect. But what do we see in the data? What do we see? What are the stylized facts? Well, actually, we see prolonged periods of output away from its long run rate when we have economic booms and prolonged periods below its rate in recessions. So the model doesn't explain this inertia that we see in the data. The period, the prolonged period of movements in output that we actually see. And even if we try to stylize the models, introduce forward variables to try to capture some inertia, we still some way from describing the stylized fact in these type of models. What we need is some way to put inertia into prices to slow down the adjustment of prices in the model. So flexible prices gives us this result. We can also stylize the monetary rule to allow for a more realistic monetary policy. We can show that the central bank, apart from setting the money supply exogenously at M bar and through an un, in an unanticipated way through mu t, can also have a reaction to deviations in output from its long run rate. So one particular monetary rule that we could use is called feedback stabilization policy, where the money supply is set exogenously by the central bank in an unanticipated way by the central bank or beyond the control of the central bank, but also negatively on movements in output from 
the long run rate. So there's some effort here by policymakers to stabilize the economy. If output is increasing above its long run rate, then there'll be some negative effect on the money supply and we see a reduction in prices. So phi becomes the policy parameter and it's the weight that the central bank attaches to the deviations in output from its long run rate Y star. Even if we use this monetary rule instead of the one we gave earlier, we find that policy is again neutral and that the our solution for output still has no M bar or phi in it, so it's actually neutral to policy. If we change the rule to one that uses the contemporaneous output gap, in other words, yt minus y star rather than yt minus 1, it might be more realistic to think that the central bank will react to today's output uh, or the difference in today's output from its long run rate. Then we do have a slight difference. We can use this as the monetary rule and I recommend that you do that. You replace the money rule with equation 3 given earlier in the lecture for the simple model with this monetary rule and crank a solution for that. If we use this rule you will find that again we have policy neutrality in other words, equilibrium output has no M bar, but we do have some effect on the variance of Y. So we see that the parameter, the policy parameter phi, does end up in the solution for output in some way as attached to the collection of parameters which govern the effect of the shock. If we look at some actual evidence, so here we have some US time series for money, M2 and M1 measures. So M1 being narrow money, M2 being broad money, and real GDP. And the both growth rates, all growth rates have been normalized. So they oscillate around 0%. We can see that if there's two parts of this data, there seems to be a part between 1967 and the early 80s where there is a clear relationship between money and output. And there's a clear correlation though there's some um, this becomes less clear as we move into the mid 70s. So in earlier part of the data there's a clear relationship although the volatilities are different. But after the 1980s, we see that the relationship between money and output is much less clear. There are periods of rising money at the same time as falling GDP. Here we have the GDP falling whilst money is rising. Why do we have this breakdown of relationships in the mid or the early 80s? We could say that part, this may partly be due to financial deregulation. With the introduction of financial innovations like automatic tilling machines, cash point machines, credit cards, other kinds of financial vehicles and innovations, that money supply has become more volatile. And that's why we see um, a less clear relationship between output and money in the second half of this time series. So the first half of the time series really supports the Keynesian proposition that output and money are unrelated. And the second half of this time series supports the rational expectations hypothesis where there is no relationship between money and output. Secondly, from the figure before the time series we see that M1 and M2, the two measures of money, seem to act as leading indicators to output. In other words we see M1 and M2 moving first 
and then alpha moving. So an increase in M1 leading to an increase in alpha. That's important because remember our solution, equilibrium solution for output is that Y is not a function of M bar. If it was a function of M bar, then we would expect money to lead output because it's driving output. So it suggests, the data is suggesting up to the mid 80s that M1 and M2 are right hand side variables in any relation between output and money. So in the short run, there appears to be some correlation. But however, it depends on which type of measure of money we're using and of course which section of the data we're looking at. So remember that after 1982, the role of money in the cycle appears to have changed. And despite the Keynesian models or new Keynesian models coming later, we see the data seems to suggest a renewed interest or a new, renewed evidence for the rational expectations hypothesis result. Look at another study by McCandless and Weber in 1995. They've used some time series data between the 60s and 90s with 110 countries. This is panel data. They've looked at two subsamples for robustness, 21, oh, so they've got the whole sample, 21 OECD as a subsample, that's the Operation for Economic Cooperation and Development. 21 OECD countries and 14 Latin American countries. And they estimate the long run average rates of growth for GDP M0, M1, and M2, and look at the correlation between the two. And we see that for the entire sample of 110 countries, that the correlation is weak. 0 0.05 for M1 and 0 0.01, in fact, they're weak for all measures of money. It also shows a negative relation, which is surprising, as we expect an increase in the money supply to give us an increase in output, not a decrease. When they look at the OECD countries, however, we see a robust relation and a positive one. So for this subsample, we see the relations that supports the Keynesian view. When I look at the Latin American countries, we see a decrease, uh, which is unusual, a decrease in output uh, coming from an increase in the money supply. And if we look at chart two, which is like a correlogram for the change in output observations for real output growth against money growth, we have a positive relationship, we might expect a 45 degree line or the observations to be huddled around this 45 degree line. But it appears that for any particular real output growth rate, say 5 or 10% here, we can have any uh, level of money growth. So again, it shows very little relationship when we look at the ensemble. Here we have a group of studies showing mixed conclusions for the economic question is what does money have an effect on output? Cormendi and McGuire in 1985 using the measure M1 related to real GDP of 47 countries found a negative correlation as you We've already said we would expect a positive one. Kuwecki, 1986, using M1 and M2 in the US with annual and monthly data, found money super neutrality, so which supports the rational expectations hypothesis. Dwyer and Haffer used real GDP and GNP over 62 countries and found a slight negative correlation it's not statistically significant, 
So even over 62 countries, but only five year period, there was a negative correlation. Again, we would expect a positive one. And Poirier 91 using M1 and real GDP found money neutral in some countries, but not in others. That might be to depending on a country's level of development. Remember that in the time series data that we gave earlier, we see there was a period from the 80s where these relationship breaks down. And that may be caused by financial deregulation. So if some countries haven't been through financial deregulation, perhaps there is relationships between money and output in these countries. To sum up, in general, in the long run, there's no clear correlation between growth rates of money and real output, which would support the rational expectations hypothesis. So this holds across all definitions of money, but not for the subsample of OECD countries, given the McCandless and Weber study, where there is a strong positive relationship. So what is it, what is it about the OECD countries? So there is empirical support for rational expectations, but really more only in the long run. And which is what we would expect, isn't it? That the long run output would be unaffected by movements in money in the long run of prices have adjusted. Though this support seems less clear for the OECD countries, which support the Keynesian proposition.